Good morning, good morning, good morning. I am Julie Anderson. I am the Chief Operating Officer here at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Thank you for joining us today. Um, just a really quick moment about BPC and then we'll get right to our really interesting panel. BPC's mission is to combine the best ideas from both parties to promote opportunity for all Americans. Our policy solutions are the product of informed, often contentious uh, deliberations. Colleges and universities, as we were hearing this morning, play a really key role in helping to prepare the next generation of leaders to be able to have that ability to engage in those sometimes contentious, informed deliberations. And that's why earlier this year, we launched our um, Campus Free Expression Project. Um, the project is focused on developing campus policies that encourage an open and respectful exchange of ideas and then helping colleges and universities actually implement those policies. According to a May College Pulse survey, 68% of students say that their campus climate precludes them from expressing true opinions. Another study published by Moore and Common in June, and I found this one particularly interesting, analyzed both Republicans and Democrats' perceptions of how extreme they thought the other side of the aisle was. The study found that the more college education you had, the more likely you were to overestimate the extreme views on the other side of the aisle. <laughs> A third study from Pew found that only about half of Americans, and this is a little depressing to me, think that higher education is having a positive impact on our country these days. So clearly there's a lot going on, and yet most students want their college experience to include an open and vigorous exchange of diverse ideas. So we're really excited today to have panelists with us who are students themselves to help us, help us explore these um, tough and important questions. Uh, there are many different approaches to solving problems, to creating real cultures of and commitments to an open exchange of ideas. Uh, the panel today will share some of the approaches that they are trying out on their campuses. <laughs> Uh, BPC really appreciates and understands what they are trying to do. We work with and strive to work with a real diverse array of stakeholders and pull them together. And as most, as our, most of our policy um, projects can attest, even when folks are voluntarily coming to the table, it is often really hard to reach consensus. It takes leadership. And um, I'm really excited to hear from these student leaders. And with that, I will turn it over to Jackie Pfeffer-Merrill, who is the director of our Campus Free Expression Project. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Julie. And, and thanks very much to all of you for coming out today on this special Constitution Day. So 232 years ago today, the delegates in Philadelphia signed the Constitution. And at colleges and universities across the country, uh, there are special Constitution Day events happening on, on every campus that receives federal funds in the United States. So we were very fortunate today to lure these five students away from their own campuses. And as a former college professor myself, I feel a little bit guilty about asking them to miss classes once again. But we're just really excited to hear about how they each on their own campuses, public and private, from California to Virginia and Rhode Island, all across the country, are helping to promote a culture of free expression on their campuses. So I know you have their bios, and I'm going to introduce them just very, very briefly. Daniel Costa Riva is a junior at American University. He's the president of the American University chapter of Students for Free Expression, and he's just joined the National Board of Students for Free Expression, on which I also serve. So it was welcome as a trustee to welcome Daniel to our board. Uh, Alec Grevin is a junior at the University of Richmond, and he is uh, serves on the Students uh, Senate and also is the co-chair of the Special Commission, help me if I get it not quite right, on uh, free expression on, at the University of Richmond. Um, uh, Jenny Grev is a senior at Claremont McKenna College, where she is a co-chair of the All In Democracy Challenge, which is encouraging uh, voting in, in the upcoming election. And she's also been involved in bringing students together to talk about Israeli-Palestinian issues. Manu Miel is a senior at the University of California, Berkeley. He is the CEO of uh, Bridge USA, a national organization of students that promotes 
freedom of expression and respectful conversation on college campuses. And Jimmy Thompson is a uh, senior at Brown University where he is the president of SPEAK, uh, which uh, examines uh, viewpoint diversity on his campus. And uh, Jimmy, I'm going to start with you. So one of the things that's really true about freedom of expression is that there's a lot of anecdote. And uh, we know that the plural of anecdote is not data. So one of the things that SPEAK has done on its campus is, and now is will be bringing out its third report this year is to develop a metric of viewpoint diversity amongst its speakers on campus. So Jimmy, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about why that seemed the right approach and what, how you put together the metric and what you found. Sure. Um, yeah, so Speak is a group that, that measures uh, sorts of the ideological diversity of speakers who are invited to campus. So we developed a qualitative and a quantitative metric. So that involved things like FEC data, um, prior positions, uh, working of the speakers who are invited in, social media posts. Um, we applied that to over 500 speakers the past uh, few years who have been invited to Brown. Um, and we came up with uh, the number 96%, which leaned a certain way. We won't say which way politically. Um, I, you can go ahead and, and say. Well, sure, they lean left. Um, so, and then even if you subdivided that down by different categories, right, such as just topics related to US politics, even those lectures, they still had about the same sort of leaning. Um, so this upcoming year, we're excited to hopefully make our data even more rigorous, um, in addition to working on some new projects. Um, so Manu, uh, Bridge USA is a, a national organization and you have led the organization at UC Berkeley. So can you tell us a little bit about what Bridge USA is yeah. and your, your national strategy? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, I just want to first say that the work that Jimmy's doing, I think is actually one of the most important things that we need in this space, which is data and analytics. You know, we talk about politics and we especially talk about free expression and what's happening in college campuses and we don't actually have any numbers to back it up. And I think that one of the biggest challenges um, that a lot of organizations you know, are going to face in this space is not being able to quantify impact. So um, I just wanted to say that first. Uh, and then you know, second in regards to what Bridge does, uh, you know, I think that it's first important to frame the problem around why, why exactly is free speech and freedom of expression and you know, why are we seeing sort of a disengagement against young, um, amongst young people. And I think that there's basically two main factors that I've at least seen. And most of the students that have, that have spanned sort of bridge campuses across the country, they sort of see. I think the first thing is uh, political apathy and a disengagement from politics. I mean, for people our age, I feel like the norm is, is you know, the Obama administration and the Trump administration. And so if you sort of look at the legislative accomplishments of those two administrations, it's pretty dim perspective on what democracy looks like. So if you've already had a starting point where young people feel like politics is not working, I mean, what's, what's the expectation? They, there's not much being put into the system. And I think the second problem is university and, and learning is slowly becoming a battleground for politics rather than being an insulated uh, cos you know, a cosm of, of knowledge production. So Bridge is really trying to figure out you know, how can we first attack the university problem? And then second, how do we create tangible change in democracy so that democracy can work for young people? Because you can't expect a generation to get engaged if the system is broken. I'm going to break it up a little, a little bit here. Alec, uh, so you've tried to uh, encourage the adoption of the Chicago Statement at the University of Richmond. So not everybody here will know what the Chicago Statement is. So can you just tell us a little bit about what the Chicago Statement is and, yeah. and how you got interested in having that adopted at Richmond? Um, yeah, so in my class we were looking at free expression mm -hmm. in higher education. And so we were looking at different speech statements. One of them was the Chicago Statement, which in a nutshell is focused on um, allowing like almost all speech as long as it doesn't violate um, constitutional um, measures um, within the First Amendment. And so it's a very broad statement that encourages robust dialogue on a college campus. And so I was looking at, um, at my school um, at the University of Richmond, which is a private school, meaning it doesn't have to follow the First Amendment. Um, and I was looking like some of the speech policies that we have, which aren't always enforced, but um, speech that is unwelcome, that's hostile, that's offensive, that's inappropriate as deemed by the university, um, could be banned um, or censored. And uh, 
um, these are very broad and sweeping, um, sweeping statements. And so um, one of the things that I've been trying to do is um, I authored a resolution um, in my school student government um, that was passed unanimously asking for um, a overarching um, speech statement to be passed by the University of Richmond that clarifies and then also um, gives specific protections to free expression. And so um, I would like it to be similar to Chicago in the sense that it should be something that protects First Amendment constitutional speech, something that encourages dialogue and kind of speaks to the importance of free expression um, within the community. And so I've been working with my school president. Um, he just formed a free expression task force. Um, and the task force is drafting a statement now. And we hope to get it approved by the Board of Trustees within the year. And Jenny, I'm going to come back to you. So you're the co-chairman of the All In Democracy Challenge, which is a national challenge. Uh, I think it's active in 48 states. And you're leading the effort at Claremont McKenna. So tell us uh, more about that, please. Sure, yeah. Um, so I got involved with the All On Campus Democracy Challenge. Um, it's the first year um, that we've started this on my campus. Um, and I felt personally drawn to this issue um, because my first year in college um, was the year of the 2016 election. Um, and I felt like when I arrived at college, College, um, I didn't have the opportunity to engage with or discover my own political views. I felt like both sides of the conversation um, were placing um, ideas of where I should fall on the spectrum and encouraging me to vote in particular ways. Um, and so this year, um, as a senior at Claremont McKenna, I've decided to start this initiative prior to the 2020 election um, to encourage political engagement, particularly from students who aren't already engaged in political conversations on campus. Um, I think it's important that we're engaging a broad array of students and provide them the opportunity to um, not only vote based on how they feel, but actually develop those political beliefs through conversation. And so it sounds like you're also planning some issue forums so that students become more conversant with those issues and they, they are more excited to vote because they're more knowledgeable about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm hoping to um, work with my college to plan forums um, similar to what I've worked on in the past for the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Um, I became engaged on that issue um, during my first year of college. Um, I came in as part of the uh, more Zionist camp. And throughout college, I challenged my own beliefs um, uh, to the point in which I decided to work with my college administration to um, plan an event that brought an Israeli, Palestinian, and American delegate who all um, were representatives at the Camp David uh, negotiations to campus um, and afterwards held a forum for students to hold a conversation about their beliefs and about what they've learned. Um, so I'm hoping to, to bring a similar forum to campus for other controversial issues, whether that's immigration, gun reform, or whatever else, so that students can come into the 2020 election um, feeling excited and prepared to vote for whoever they may choose. All right, thank you. And then, Daniel, you've also been really active on the viewpoint diversity and uh, letting students know about other various points of view through Students for Free Expression. Can you tell us a little bit about Students for Free Expression at American University and, and why it's gone national? Yeah, definitely. So Students for Free Expression at American University is a very interesting case because we were the first officially recognized chapter of Students for Free Expression uh, nationwide. And we're sort of the battleground or the testing ground for all these different ideas that we're, you know, we try through AU and then if it works, we export it to our other campuses that are starting to spring up. Um, and amongst those, we've had, uh, we're, first of all, we're trying to fight the perception that free speech is a right-wing ideal. Uh, we're trying to you know, talk to people and let them know, like, hey, this isn't something that is just for one side of the political or, um, battle or the other. Like, this is something that benefits everybody and that like, we can all benefit from and we should all be fighting for. And the other thing that we've been trying to do in terms of viewpoint diversity, we actually last fall hosted an event in conjunction with the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, uh, Better Angels, and Student Free Expression uh, to bring these Better Angels style debates to campus. And it's essentially, to sort of give you the short spiel, these debates are uh, they're moderated in a sense in which it prevents people from fighting about issues that otherwise would be very controversial. And it brings them all together. And they're student-centered. So anybody who shows up to the room can participate in the debate. And uh, the, one of the great things about the format of the debates is they're so successful at preventing these all-out brawls over things that would be controversial that we had a group of students on campus that showed up with the express purpose of shutting down the event. And before the night was over, they were actively partaking by you know, not when they agreed with something or giving up speeches in the middle of the room and whatnot. 
And those are just some of the ways in which we've been trying to engage in campus. We also hosted with the Political Theory Institute an event in which we brought over Robert George and Cornell West on campus, and they talked about the importance of viewpoint diversity and of engaging with the other side. And that's just some of the examples and some of the ways in which we've been trying to fight it at the university level so we can then export the most successful ones to our other campuses. Great. Yeah. And I just want to ask all of you about um, you know, what is it really like on campus today? Because you know, looking out at the audience, uh, you know, there are others like me who are not, have not been on campus uh, most recently. And I think there's a lot of view in the public that this generation is a, a generation that's been coddled. Uh, in 2015, uh, snowflake generation was uh, the phrase of the year, according to one, one list. And, is, I'm wondering, is it is it there's a weakness amongst this generation, and you few are the the shining uh, exceptions, or is it the case that there's a really big moderate middle, and uh, what what seems to get all the attention is the extremes that that make it seem like there's a, a real crisis of freedom of expression on campus. Yeah, oh, okay. any anyone, please. Sure. Um, so I mean, I, I guess I've always been of the opinion that um, anyone who wants to kind of get a complete and well-rounded education can get one at Brown for sure. I mean, I think we have good dialogue. I open up the Herald all the time. That's our newspaper. Um, and there's debate on both sides, right? Students, I think, can participate pretty well in all sorts of dialogue. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty happy, even though, right, just because uh, most people on campus hold a certain political leaning doesn't mean that that can interfere with your own pursuit of your own education. I haven't found that the case at all. In fact, I found that it's it's helped me. So, yeah. uh, I guess I'll take a hit at this one. Um, so I want to um, give you an example of what this dichotomy of different views looks like. Um, I think there's one camp that says, you know. If a controversial speaker comes to campus and it might offend particularly diverse groups to shut them down, and there's the other camp that says, well, OK, I think the best way for tackling this is to engage with it. Um, and the prime example of that on my campus was three years ago during a Heather McDonald protest. Um, this changed um, the course of my college and the way in which we have dealt with free speech over the last couple of years and will continue to. So um, Heather McDonald comes to campus and there's a protest. Um, and there's a protest of students shutting down um, the, the, her speech that evening. And there's this other group of students, um, and you can clearly see this divide because the students showing up for her talk were dressed in business clothes, and the students protesting were dressed in street clothes. <laughs> and those students showed up for the event um, with the aim of asking her difficult questions um, and with the opportunity to get answers um, on some of the issues in which um, they disagreed with her. Um, and I think this shows the difference to how different students are dealing with this issue. Although there may be a group who seeks to shut down conversation, there's an entirely different group of students who says, hold on, I think the best way to deal with this is to engage and to ask questions, um, but to challenge people who you disagree with. So I definitely think at the University of Richmond, um, there is a huge moderate middle. Um, but then there's definitely some people that are very um, strongly in favor of free expression. And then there's some people that are very um, kind of like opposed um, to what we're doing. So like one example is um, after I presented to the faculty senate on this issue, um, one of the professors um, sent out like a public email saying that I was um, part of the conservative right seeking to weaponize free speech, that this was a dangerous issue, that it would dismantle social justice initiatives. Um, but that professor definitely does not reflect like a very large segment of the campus um, at all. And so I also got a lot of support behind it as well. And so I think a lot of uh, this issue is reaching out um, to people in that middle and building that common ground to show that this isn't a partisan issue. Um, one of the things I did with that was I reached out to both the president of the college Democrats and the president of the college Republicans. And this was like right in the heat of, of midterms. Um, and just talked to, with them about free expression. And they actually signed a joint letter um, and wrote it in our school newspaper um, saying that both the college Democrats and the college Republicans Republicans endorsed um, this free expression policy and that free expression is vital to like the existence of both those clubs, that without the ability to challenge ideas, to hear um, different ideas and have that discussion back and forth, um, we really can't have a good political discussion. So I definitely say there are a lot of students that are willing to have the conversation. Part of it is you just have to be able to reach out to them because I think there's a lot of students because free expression can be very contentious. It can be a buzzword. Um, a lot of people just kind of want to withdraw, not, not engage with the issue. And um, that would be quite tragic if if students did that. So, 
Adding to that, um, at American University, when I was first moving onto campus my freshman year, I was terrified. I was sort of expecting to be fighting a constant up uphill battle, especially once I found out that AU had been raided by the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education as a red light school. Uh, but when I got to campus and I actually started talking to people, I found out that most of the students I talked to were actually in agreement with me. Maybe at first they had a bit of a visceral reaction against the word free speech, because the first thing their minds jumped to were sort of like extreme uh, right-wing conservative speakers and things like that. But once once you actually sit down and have a conversation, very, very, very few times have people actually expressly come out against free speech. Uh, most of the time when you talk to students, they support it. Um, sometimes they're scared to sort of have that fight in the classroom, but they themselves seem to support it, and the majority of the AU community seems to as well. So I, I want to then ask about if there, if there is a majority and a big middle that is really welcoming this. You know, Julie shared a statement in her, in her introduction that Gallup found that more, well more than half of students feel that the, the, the climate on their campus prevents at least some students from expressing their views. So and I, you know, I would say if that's more than half of the students feel that way, that means that 100% of students aren't really having the full educational experience they, they should have. So why is it that so many students feel like they can't say what they think for fear of others taking offense? So, one thing I can add to that. Um, so we stated at the beginning of this, you know, the plural of anecdote is not necessarily data. Mm -hmm. But um, there's been instances in which I've spoke out in classrooms where I've disagreed with the majority. And the pushback, and this varies from classroom to classroom. It obviously depends on who the students and the professor are. But the pushback is so strong that I can definitely see as to why students would be opposed to speaking out as well. The particular instance I'm thinking about was last year we had a circumstance in which a five second video was posted on Twitter, uh, filmed on campus, about a student using a slur. And a mass email was sent to all professors sort of telling them to address the situation on campus. And the first class of the day was an 8 a.m. morning class, so I, you know people might have been cranky since it was so <laughs> early. But the professor started talking about the situation, and at one point he said something along the lines of like, oh, there's no circumstances in which a slur should ever uh, be used or written, even in an academic setting. And I, at that point in time, I was taking a literature class for a separate class, a literature class on the beat generation. And if you guys know anything about the beats, <laughs> is that you know the, those, the idea that one professor had just said and the idea of reading the beats sort of did not go hand in hand. So I raised my hand and I said, you know, I, I, I would respectfully, respectfully disagree. I don't think censoring these, uh, this language and you know when reading historical texts or historical on, in their historical context brings anything positive to the table. And instead, it sort of infantilizes students and creates this perception that um, you know you have to be protected, you have to be hidden from these words. And there was about, for the next 30 minutes after that, just constant attacks thrown my way uh, by students on the classroom. There was even students who were saying things on the lines of like, well, obviously you come from a very white, privileged, rich background. <laughs> As an immigrant, I thought that was very odd. Um, you know, but th that was the sort of thing that was being thrown about. And eventually my professor sort of stepped in, and he apologized for not having stepped in earlier. But um, Seeing that and being on the receiving end of that, I can definitely see how students who are more shy or maybe don't feel as confident about their political positions might be scared to come forward and might be scared to add to the conversation. Yeah. If, if I could just add to sort of the, the train of uh, getting attacked. So the, when, we, when we originally founded Bridge USA, um, the first ever uh, panel that we did, I, they, they were like, you're a Nazi. And I was like, <laughs> I need to go find a mirror real quick. Let me make sure that we both are looking at the same, same person. And I think that, and, and the funny thing is like, you know, I, and, and before, I, before I say this, what I, what I, I want to attack this from a different notion, which is that I think that we need to reclaim and understand that you know, partisanship isn't necessarily a negative force. You know, the, the fact that we have so many people that are excited and have strong convictions on different, it, that's, a, that's an amazing thing. People in democracy strive to have people that are really active and really engaged. So I think that we need to make a distinction between being moderate in action versus being moderate in politics. And I think that what that's sort of getting at is we have a lot of people on campus that have super strong convictions and are super engaged in certain beliefs, but also understand that you know when they when they're engaging and when they're expressing those beliefs, they need to be constructive in how they engage those beliefs. And I think that one of the biggest problems that we have here is, and, and this is a paradox, is if so many people believe that free expression and discussion is a good thing, why isn't that a reality? And the reason why is because we keep using, I think, this language of moderation that often actually 
you know, turns people off because it's it's something that it's something that sometimes you know compromises sort of become a dirty word in our politics. And I think that we need to push back against this. It's a great thing that we've got people that have strong beliefs, but let's figure out how we can give them the necessary skills, training, um, and opportunities to make sure that they're making the most of their potential in the most constructive way. And as people start to get more and more engaged in constructive ways, and as they start to see that change is possible without just going out and protesting and breaking some windows, you know, that's how you get people involved, and that's how you get a generation engaged. Um, and just the last point I want to make is us four, we exist on various different campuses, all kind of doing the same thing. I think that there's there's huge potential for a national movement. You know, there needs to be a way to start to consolidate all these efforts. You know, how do we make sure that what's happening at Claremont, what's happening at Richmond, what's happening at Berkeley, what's happening at Brown, you know, how do we catalyze this passion so that you have concerted change? Because when the voice of young people is active in this country, you have a lot of progress on key issues. And so let's 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 start to activate these voices and let's get it consolidated around this issue because I think that there's real real possibility. Well, and kind of speaking off that too, I'm I'm doing a lot of like policy um, change, basically like allowing like making sure there aren't like policy repercussions. But that's quite different from making sure that like there's actually like good dialogue that's coming out. Um, just because someone's allowed to say something doesn't mean that they're actually going to be prompted. And so I, people use the word like a chilling effect, and that's a real concern that like there are tough conversations, and because things are polarized, people are just going to avoid having the conversations, and um, that's not going to be good at all. And so I think that's one of the things too is people have this tendency to just like express their beliefs. And then what happens is they don't actually have dialogue with people that they disagree. And so like for example, they'll listen to someone, they'll say like, that's the conservative position, I'll absolutely listen to it. But then they'll just kind of like label it as that's the conservative position. Or they'll like hear someone say something and it's like, that's the liberal position. And just kind of like leave it there in a box. And it's like, that's them, that's them, and then this is me. Um, and there's a separation there. There's not a dialogue that's actually going back and forth. And so I think what's really important that needs to happen on college campuses is when someone gives a position, not just like letting them say their position, but actually like asking them questions, like actually like listening, like seeking to understand more of the nuances, because that's actually where you find like where you agree. That's where you find like that common belief, because like pretty much everyone has those systems of common belief. But when people are labeled and put in boxes, you're not having like that common understanding. I wanted to jump onto that. I think that my experience on campus is a very clear example of the problem when there isn't a space for engagement um, and, we, and you don't go in with uh, the desire to actually engage with the other person's beliefs. Um, so when I arrived at college as a first year, um, I held very adamant beliefs about um, the Israel space. Um, and as I'm sure you all know, that's one of the most polarizing issues on college campuses today. Um, and I went my entire first year without actually having the opportunity to engage productively with the other side. Um, it wasn't until um, the summer following that when I was um, actually randomly paired with a Palestinian roommate that I began to open up um, and understand um, the other person's beliefs and engage with them in an empathetic way. Um, and I found this very powerful because Oftentimes in conversation um, or in listening to another person's beliefs, you don't need to directly respond to their critiques of your argument. But I found that when living with her and, and having these very clear conversations, you know, I was forced to think about what I was saying and the implications of the argument in which I was making. Um, and following this experience, I ended up publishing an article about how powerful um, this experience was to me. Um, and when it was shared by 400 people ar around the nation, I realized that a, that there's a need for these spaces for conversation um, that are not happening at all. Um, and uh, B, that like this story is important and it's one that we need to continue to tell that when we do engage, something productive should and, and often does come out of it. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I've heard from several of you is that you know, you've had opportunities to work with with faculty, um, you know, uh, the the dean uh, Claremont McKenna to help design a forum on, on Israeli-Palestinian issues, and at Berkeley, I know you have the leadership of Chancellor Chris. Uh, uh, Richmond, you mentioned working with uh, your terrific president, who has a, himself a wonderful series of uh, the spider talks, uh, where they bring in conversations about difficult issues. Is it is this something students can really take leadership on themselves, or uh, does it depend on having a faculty and an administration that is supportive of your efforts? Uh, 
Oh, you go. Oh, well, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I'd say absolutely no. Um, it's not dependent upon the faculty. So um, this past year, I've been obsessed with finding the next Greer Brigham, right? So Greer Brigham was our founder. Uh, he was the original visionary behind uh, sort of modeling those speakers who come to Brown in a data-centric way. Um, and it turns out, right, while I'm asking and talking to the Brown students, they too have ideas that are kind of like Greer, right? And they want to change the campus in certain ways as well. So they're people of passion and of action, right? And I think that's what really separates speak members. So for instance, we have students who want to publish a new paper on campus. We have students who want to start a new social science experiment to determine how political content is uh, handled by social media platforms. We have a student who also wants to pass the Chicago statement on campus. Um, so I think that, you know, I guess faculty support is nice, student support is nice, but I think at the end of the day, having students who, who really care about things, who are passionate and who are smart, I mean, I think that can make all the world a difference. So. Yeah. Um, at, at Bridge, I mean, so we're at, um, we're at about 25 campuses across the country, and what we've noticed is that the most impactful campuses are the ones where you can actually combine sort of the, the institutional support with widespread uh, student engagement. Um, two really quick examples on this. The ASU chapter, so uh, the Arizona State University chapter, at, at um, they, what they did was they, they mobilized a lot of students. And in a year, they actually massed enough support where ASU lobbied. This is not all because of the chapter, but one of the big factors was the chapter. ASU lobbied the Republican legislature of Arizona to give $6 million to the university to create the School for Civility and Economic Thought. And they graduated 36 majors last year. I mean, student action is a good thing, and students should be empowered. But when you can involve institutions and a lot of these administrators, and when you can uh, avoid alienating a key part of the solution, that's when you have really transformative change. And the second quick example, and this is funny because you said uh, it's Constitution Day, so universities that are given federal funds need to celebrate and have some sort of event. So in 2017, when Bridge actually started, when Milo was invited um, to UC Berkeley, and there's the big blowback and everything, President Trump tweeted, UC Berkeley federal funds, question mark, like three times. And so UC Berkeley <laughs> no longer celebrates Constitution Day. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But um, <laughs> is this going to Chancellor Christ? <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, we, we got the university involved in, in, in navigating the issue. and. It just I, actually, this is back in February. There was a conservative activist that got uh, punched on campus, and unlike when what happened with Milo and the uh, the uh, campus was pretty timid with what to do, they were like, "No, this is this is wrong. We know that we have student support behind us. We know that we can defend not the conservative beliefs of this activist or their liberal beliefs. We can defend the fact that you can't punch people. This is this is a democracy. So um, I think you you have to combine a grassroots approach with a with an institutional approach, and that's that's how you really get transformative change. Yeah, um, I would actually argue that in order to um, make the make positive change on campus and do so in a way that isn't a administrative pushing against students, I think that the most effective movements are done in partnership. Um, because although some might argue that students every four years graduate and a new generation comes in, um, to move forward with initiatives without student support um, can actually like hinder opportunities for free speech and, and can make it so that sometimes the administration acts as a parent saying, oh, you shouldn't protest, oh, you shouldn't do this. But it's not until there is student buy-in um, that, uh, it's, that, it's, that the movements can be effective. I think another important aspect of sort of involving the faculty and the administration is a sort of morale aspect to the whole fight for free speech. Uh, when you feel like you're the only person on campus advocating for this, it can be very disheartening. When a professor says, hey, like you're doing great work, you know, that, that definitely is very encouraging and that sort of helps keep the movement going. Um, and that professor can point you in the right directions when you're looking for certain resources or you're trying to find speakers and whatnot. Uh, but they're not what, um, like, well, they're a very important part and, a, and an integral part of sort of starting. Uh, even in campuses where professors or the administration or the faculty might not be friendly to this movement, uh, there's still work that can be done by the students. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
I want to ask a little bit more about the faculty senate experience. Uh, t tell us a little bit about uh, more, a little bit more about how that came up and yeah. was and what came out uh, in the end. Yeah. Um, so what I did was um, I presented the resolution to the student government. It was passed unanimously by the Richmond College Student Government Association, which is quite remarkable that you can get um, unanimous like student support in that body. Um, and so then after we passed that, I brought it to the faculty senate, um, which is a kind of one branch of um, the university administration. And, and can you just tell us a little bit, about, I mean, how is a student, that? how did you get it into the, the faculty senate? Um, so I reached out to President Crutcher, um, so I emailed um, him and then he put me in contact with the uh, president of the faculty senate and so then I worked um, with that president. Um, they set up a meeting where I would come and present, and so then I gave the presentation. Um, and definitely, like, I got tough questions, some like very valid questions of like procedurally, like what are the implications of it? How do we bring it about? Do we have like the power to do it? Um, and what's interesting is like there are definitely like several like faculty very very strongly in support of what I was doing. Um, there are several faculty members just asking like why is this a problem? Why do we need um, kind of this um, free expression statement? And then there uh, were some professors like the professor I mentioned. Um, um, that thought this was a very partisan issue, that it was dangerous, that it should not um, be discussed at all, um, and that it was dangerous to discuss it. Um, and so what I did was, um, after I presented, um, I wrote an op-ed um, in our student newspaper, kind of outlining kind of the reasoning why the proposal, um, why we went kind of forward with um, this direction, kind of what the, what the intention um, was behind it here. So I've definitely gotten um, a lot of different support, but I think a lot of it is articulating kind of why it's important. And I was doing, um, a lot of this like kind of policy work kind of out of the blue and the fact that like nothing like happened that was serious on campus that like prompted it. I was just looking at the policy and seeing I just don't think that the pol like the policy is too broad, doesn't give enough um, guidelines. And so while they were having this conversation of like why is it important, um, I believe a couple months later, um, a speaker named Ryan Anderson was um, invited to Richmond's campus. Um, and Ryan Anderson, I had no idea who the speaker was um, prior to um, him coming on campus, um, but had said um, controversial statements about um, transgender um, people in the past. And so there were calls um, to disinvite um, the speaker, and um, there was like a lot of people that wanted the speaker disinvited. And then one of the problems was um, Richmond has no policy on in invita like inviting speakers, disinviting speakers. And so there was a lot of questions of, is the speaker going to be disinvited? What is the standard or policy for disinvitation, which was all kind of related to the work that I was doing like um, several months ago and um, I'm still doing. Um, and um, administration said that Ryan Anderson wasn't going to be disinvited. Um, but then what was good is um, there were students that went out, they wore white in solidarity with transgender students. They protested the speech, but they didn't shut down the speech. It was all peaceful, peaceful protest. Um, they came, they asked Ryan Anderson tough questions. Um, they also had a rebuttal speaker that came and challenged his views. And so the way that it was handled, um, I think, um, really contributed to the dialogue, created a positive discussion without like limiting the free expression rights. And so I think that's one of like the reasons why it's so important to have have a standard and I think because even though issues aren't coming up without a clear standard when issues do come up you don't have a set um, way of knowing how are we going to address this what our values are. Mm -hmm. Could I just add a quick point yeah. to it and just Alec just said I think his execution on sort of the Richmond uh, front in terms of passing a resolution through the stu student senate and in terms of principles I think is exactly the right approach the reason why the Chicago principles got so much blowback was because this was a case where only the administration enacted the policy, and there was not a lot of student engagement in the process, nor was there a lot of student support. And I think that this gets back to this question of, you can't alienate either part of the, the solution in this, in this sort of fight. Um, so I think that sort of what, what happened at Richmond, I think that model needs to be emulated because you can't, you can't enforce uh, as a university, other than sort of the basic core tenets of a university, it's very difficult to enforce something where there's, there's some tension in the student body. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that's, that's important. Yeah, it's interesting, that Colgate University that adopted the statement, they had the statement that was adopted, uh, they did a lot of work to develop the statement that was particular to their campus rather than a, a Chicago statement. And they, it was ratified by uh, the Student Senate, the Faculty Senate, and the Board of Trustees. So they try, they 
brought in all, all various parts of the, the community in order to make sure this was something that was part of our community. Um, Daniel, I want to ask you about, about the Student for Free Expression student statement. So you're trying to get students, and I believe you have over a thousand signatures on the, the SFE student statement. So why, tell us a little bit about why you're having students sign a, a, a student statement. Yeah, so the statement of principles for Students for Free Expression was sort of the first thing. Uh, it was the, I guess, what you would call it, the nucleus for SFE. Uh, it started out of University of Chicago. They held a student conference and invited students from various different universities. They all drafted the statement, signed on, and then you know, four years later, here we are, and there's about 1,700 signatures. Uh, it's not only students, even though we do focus on students, so you should all go sign it at tinyurl.com forward slash free expression. Um, <laughs> you should all sign on. But the, the, the purpose of the statement is sort of to implement that strategy of enacting policy change at the university level. Uh, you know, it's a lot, if you go to your student government and you're just one person and you approach them and you're like, hey, you should pass a student. Um, you know, a, a resolution supporting free speech on campus. Um, depending on the university, you might just get laughed out of the room. But if you show up and you're like, look at this statement that's been signed by 1,700 people all over the, the, the country, and it has 100 signatures just at the university alone. Like, this is something people want. This is something people support. Um, and it's also sort of a commitment uh, by signing the statement. You're commit it's a commitment to support free expression, to support civil discourse, to engage, and to sort of be a model for, for this ideal that we're all fighting for. Um, and the overall goal is you know, we tell our chapters, hey, get as many people to sign on in your school as possible. Because if you can get 100, 200 people to sign up in your school, and then you show up to the faculty or to the administrators at the student government, and you say, look at all these names. And these are all people who graduated recently or who are still studying here at the university. And this is what they support. That definitely sends a really strong impact. And it can be a good lever if you're a smaller group that's working, and maybe you don't understand you know, very well how the student government works at the faculty senate and things like that. And going off that, I think it's important to have, like, whatever you do be particular to the university. So, like, going around getting signatures from the university. Like, um, what I'm doing is I'm not, like, pushing for, like, a rubber stamp of the Chicago statement. I, I want a Richmond um, statement, something that, like, can definitely take in the values of, like, Colgate, um, of, like, the Drake statement of principles of the Chicago statement um, that definitely protects um, free expression, has that aim. But it has to be specific to, like, the institution. It has to, like, align with our values, our principles, kind of our history. And so, um, that's definitely why, like, we can't just push for this, like, rubber stamping because, um, like you mentioned, if you just kind of rubber stamp something with a top-down approach, it's not going to actually be effective. It might be a policy, but you're not actually going to create, like, that campus conversation or that campus dialogue. I, I want to come back to something that Jimmy mentioned earlier, which is the social, social media and the, the role of social media in shaping these conversations. So College Pulse found that 64% uh, of students said social and political conversations are more likely to occur online, and only 35% said that they're more likely to incur, occur face-to-face. -face. And f for many of us in the audience, that's hard to understand because we went to college before there were, were the phone and the internet. Um, how is it that social media and these online conversations sh shape discourse? And um, is it to the good? Is it to the bad? Is it a mix? So I'm afraid I'm not the right person to ask. I don't have any social media accounts. Wow. So other <laughs> panelists, take it away. Um, yeah, I think that the main problem is that Social media isn't hap these conversations on social media aren't happening alongside in-person conversations. It's that it's actually replacing those conversations. Um, and the difference between having a conversation on social media versus in person is that you know you're not required to think on the spot about what you're saying. You're not required to really. Uh, know what you're going to say before you say it. On social media, you can you know, plan out what you say and actually like hide behind the screen and not actually um, fall accountable for your remarks. Or if someone comments back to you questioning your beliefs, you don't actually have to respond back to that critique. Um, and I think, therefore, it looks a lot differently. Um, I was actually having a conversation in my class last week about um, the importance of coming to class, you know, knowing what your peers' questioning of your argument is going to be versus, you know, already knowing that coming to class. Um, and as a class, we came up to the, came to the agreement that um, actually being held on your toes as you respond to critiques of your argument um, is something that's actually very important, um, just because you can't plan out what you're going to say. Um, I would just. 
three things on this point, two of which are not my ideas. I heard them from somewhere. And I think that they're super important to include in this conversation. But the first one is social media, if we can figure out the problem of social media and polarization. I mean, you have a tool that not only makes democracy tremendously accessible, more accessible than it's ever been in human history. Everyone can reach it from its home, uh, from their homes. That, that if we can figure out how to solve this problem, it, it can have tremendous potential. Second, uh, I don't think on social media. I actually think it's not a freedom of speech issue. It's not an issue of you can, anyone can say whatever they want. That's the problem. It's actually a freedom of reach issue. And this I heard from um, this this uh, scholar in free speech. And what they talked about was, in, on social media, you can't control who hears what you say. So there are people that are interested in, in expressing certain opinions, but they're often actually chilled by the fact that what they say is now broadcast to the world. So that, that, is actually, uh, that is actually a unique chilling effect that I hadn't thought of, but I think that's something important to include in the conversation. And then uh, third is that social media actually, I think that it's, it's actually a larger consumer problem than it is a, a a company issue. You know, we often say Facebook, uh, Twitter, they need to control the way they, they censor these things. But I mean, it's, social media is very, very similar to, you know, something like junk food. You know, you, like, there's a bunch of chips out there, there's a bunch of food out there, and we control our consumption diets, right? We don't just feed ourselves crappy food, right? The same way, we need to start developing, you know, the concept of something like an information diet. You know, we need to healthily input what we're, what we're seeing online. And we need to take responsibility on ourselves um, to view that as something that's a, a personal issue rather than a rather than a company issue. And I think that viewing the problem in that sense from a consumer side might actually help us innovate certain solutions. It might actually make it easier because then it's a it's a personal space issue. As for like the healthy input um, side, I think one of the problems with social media is just kind of the incentives and its own structure. Like, it definitely is not good for like dialogue, like actual like substantive conversations. If you think about like tweeting, you have to fit something into 250 characters, but like rarely can someone ever fit like an actually good argument um, into 250 characters. But they can fit in sound bites. They can fit in things that can get a lot of likes, that can get a lot of clicks, um, and. So the incentive there is not to like advance like a substantive argument where you can like learn the other side. It's basically to exchange sound bites. And when someone's exchanging sound bites, that's where you get like othering, where th like that's their sound bite, that's our sound bite, and it creates a lot of polarization, kind of exacerbates the whole issue. So I think that's the problem with social media is just kind of its structure is not good for like actual like substantive conversation. Yeah. Anyone else in social media? Uh, well, one thing that I think uh, is sort of talked about a little bit is the, the, the idea of the information diet. And it's like social media, it's this paradoxical tool in which through social media we have access to almost every single thought that has ever been had in the history of mankind. <laughs> and somehow people look at that tool and they decide instead they're going to create a bubble and they're only going to listen to the things they want to listen to. And that's antithetical to the idea of like a liberal <laughs> arts education and, and this pursuit of truth. And that, um, like speaking to from a different perspective than just university campuses, it, that can have very serious repercussions. Like at the university level, you have you know, people talking about how to violently disrupt events and things like that because they're only listening to like radical ideas within their bubble and that, that they radicalize each other and that can lead to violent circumstances at the university level. But when you take that at a more uh, external level, it can have even bigger consequences. So if you look at places like my home country of Venezuela, where like what you post in social media can, like, can and will be used against you by the other political side. So it's, it's, it's something where it's, it's a very powerful tool that if used correctly, could enrich and educate the entirety you know, of mankind, because most people do have access to the internet, to social media, to all these things. But sadly, uh, it's very easy, and, and I'm guilty of it too. You know, It's very easy to unfollow opinions that you don't agree with. Not even offensive opinions or, or opinions that hurt you. Just It's very easy to just unfollow somebody because they posted something you didn't like, and it's not just not what you wanted to see that day. And, and that can create this sort of um, dependency on, on creating these bubbles and listening to just the same things over and over and over again. And those closed bubbles are where like the radicalization happens. There was a, an AU student group 
uh, the one that planned to disrupt the event and ended up participating, I had infiltrated one of their group chats. And some of the things that was said uh, when controversial speakers would come on campus were scary. And there was a one point where I had to contact AUPD and I was like, hey, a student came into this group and they, and it's a very small group of students. AU has like 14,000 students. There's was less than 100 here. So it's a very small portion of the student body. But one student showed up and they posted a Google Sheets document explaining how to make assault look like self-defense, how to uh, protect yourself lethally using your fists. And they were posting slogans, slogans saying stuff like, oh, verbal violence can be um, you can defend yourself against it using like physical violence and things like that. So I had to contact the school police and say like, hey, there's an event that's happening that's very controversial, and there's a group of students insinuating that they can go over there and punch everybody in the throat, and that's okay, uh, which it's not. So it's, it's, it's that sort of weird situation. You have so much power with social media, but we choose to limit ourselves, and we choose to make the situation worse overall. And, and there has to be some sort of consumer responsibility, and people have to be conscious and decide, you know what? I am not going to unfollow that person because they're a Democrat or a Republican. I'm going to listen to what they have to say. And, and through that method, expand your political viewpoints. I, I want to kind of build on this notion of expanding your, your viewpoints. One of the things that is, is challenging, I think, for students and for campus leaders to in the conversation about freedom of expression is that it can seem like freedom of expression is at odds with a campus that is diverse and inclusive. And uh, you know, college polls found when they asked students which value is more important, freedom of expression or having a society that is diverse and inclusive, more than 40% said it's more important to have a, a, a society that is diverse and inclusive. And I think we would probably all agree that that's really a false trade-off, that we can have freedom of expression and a, a, a campus that is really diverse, inclusive, safe, um, is welcoming to all of the constituents that, that come to a campus, and especially on a public campus, very diverse community. So when you hear that argument that freedom of expression is hostile to diversity or to having a really inclusive setting, how do you manage that, that concern? So I, I definitely agree. I think it's um, a false dichotomy, and um, you can absolutely have um, inclusivity and diversity and also free expression. Um, and I definitely think if you're like anti-free expression that you want to close off like certain views or um, prevent that, you're almost like necessarily being exclusive. Um, one of the things that I think um, schools can do um, to kind of really promote both values at the same time, um, an example is Christopher Newport um, University in Virginia. Um, what they did was they passed a free expression statement that was very good, um, but at the same time they also passed um, I, diversity and inclusivity um, statement affirming that that's their value as well. And so we're doing a similar thing at Richmond. Um, we're trying to work on getting the free expression statement passed, but then also um, President Crutcher, the president of Richmond, um, is also um, forming a task force um, and promoting issues related to inclusive excellence. And so also making sure um, that diversity um, and inclusivity is also um, accepted and embraced um, on our campus. And so I think one of the critical like features of it is that a lot of it's on the students that if we need to have free expression, it's then a responsibility of students to make sure that people's voices are being heard in the conversation. It puts a responsibility on society in general to make sure that we're including everyone and that we also challenge people when they propose ideas that aren't inclusive, that don't um, speak to diversity. There's a particular story that sort of is brought to mind when I think of this idea of like, uh, diversity and free speech. And that is, a lot of people think that free speech is against diversity because free speech uh, can be offensive. And some people go as far as to say that it can be hurtful. And there was a speaker at the, uh, Fire for, uh, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Education conference last summer. And I can't remember the name of the speaker to save my life. But there was a point where a student had a question for the speaker and they asked, you know, do you think that speech can be hurtful? And he said, oh, definitely. If my wife comes home one day and says, I don't love you anymore, that's going to hurt. But if I censor her, that's not going to change the fact that she doesn't love me anymore. So if, if you censor uh, speech that you know, goes against diversity, that goes or excludes certain people on campus, those opinions don't change. In fact, they might even become stronger. What you have to do is you have to work with the student body to find uh, the appropriate, what the appropriate reaction to, the, to that speech should be. Just because you're censoring everybody on campus doesn't mean they're all of a sudden going to become more welcoming. And in fact, I often hear uh, from classmates that are in some of the arts programs at AU 
this very interesting phrase. The first day of school, the professor will walk in and they say, this is a, a welcoming space, this is an inclusive space, we welcome everybody, but if you're of a different political belief that is not inclusive or welcoming, we don't welcome you. And there's a sort of weird... It's, do they it's actually a, say with a certain, certain political belief? They specifically say if your beliefs do not align with inclusivity, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, hmm. you know what we're talking about. You're not welcome in this space. Hmm. And it, it's, uh, it happens, like I've heard it particularly in coming from the dance program at American University, from professors within the dance program. Um, and th there's a sort of like weird double think going on there. We're inclusive except our own brand of inclusivity that excludes everybody we disagree with. And that, that doesn't, it just doesn't work. In fact, I would say that chilling free speech is inherently exclusive and you can't have an inclusive society if you don't have free speech because then how is the minority going to speak up if there's a, uh, you know, something unjust happens to them? It's, they go hand in hand. Uh, having free speech doesn't get rid of inclusion. Having just diversity and inclusion can get rid of free speech. So. You know, I think this is a tr tricky issue um, because there are several occasions where free speech can be directly hurtful and offensive, um, particularly to minority groups. Um, and so, I mean, as we, although we want to say that you know diversity and free speech go hand in hand, um, I think we also need to recognize the fact that. There are instances where this is hurtful, and there are instances in which we need to approach the issue of free speech and approach um, the inclusivity of all ideas um, in a way that's sensitive to the particular harms that this may cause to um, historically disadvantaged groups. Um, I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Um, but I also want to say that even as we promote spaces for free speech, the, the communities um, to support particular uh, to support these disadvantaged communities should hold equal weight. Um, although some might argue that, um, you know, uh, having a space for conversation is um, important, or that um, we must have these uh, particular communities, um, both are important um, and. Uh, E of equal importance in the sense that um, without a space where you can feel comfortable to express your beliefs in the whole sense of what they are, but also a place in which they're challenged, um, both of these spaces hold weight and importance um, on college campuses. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I like about that, I mean, there's a, a complementarity between freedom of association and when people organize into their own uh, groups that are, whether it's a religious group or a political group, where they are able to be with more like-minded people at the same time that they then go out into the, the quad. Um, and they're in a, in, not in a, a, a marketplace of ideas where everything is treated as of equal worth, but they're really challenged to develop the best and, and the most rigorous presentation of their viewpoint. Um, I think I'd love to hear from others on this really difficult question about how do we make sure that there, there isn't a sense that the freedom of expression is at the cost of diversity and inclusion. I've got, you want to go? Sure. Yeah. I, I, um, I mean, I guess, I guess the way I think about it is I try, I guess this is when using terminology like free speech, I think it kind of starts to break down because I think um, it'd be nice to depoliticize that term, right? Especially at a place like Brown, which is a private institution. So if I think about what's going on at Brown in a free speech lens, it doesn't, I can't really understand the problem a whole lot. But if I think about it in terms of, I guess, student growth, right? Students being able to pursue their own projects. Um, you know, uh, I guess sort of completing their, their academic education, um, then I think like it's, it's pretty obvious that there's not a trade-off at all. In fact, I mean, that's kind of what Speak thrives on is different sorts of folks coming together and basically challenging each other's projects and helping each other on each other's projects and, and things like that. So, but I think if you just, if you politicize free speech on campus, I just don't think it's a, it's a political term that should be applied at least to what, what's going on at Brown. Yeah. Um, just, just quickly to add, I, I think I, I just want to approach it from a different angle because I think we've 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 got a pretty good angle on, on sort of what free speech is in terms of a crisis. I think that we have to differentiate. We we sort of view people that engage in any dialogue as sort of starting from the same perspective. But I think that we have to differentiate between a pragmatic, policy-minded person versus an activist. And what I mean by that is. Someone that's an activist, usually people that make the argument that their humanity is at stake or free speech is hurting them, usually they've got some type of personal experience associated with 
a certain issue. Usually it's, you know, for example, an immigration, it's a DACA student on campus. Or in terms of, um, you know, something like abortion, it might be a sexual assault survivor on campus. There's usually some type of personal experience associated with people that argue that free speech is, is hurting their, their, their personality. Rather than attacking that concept that free speech is hurting their personality, that can't be, I think that we need to package um, the way that we approach free speech for people that are pragmatic and policy-oriented who have no actual personal attachment to a policy issue versus people that have a genuine personal attachment to a policy issue. And what I mean by that is I think we need to start, we need to, and what Bridge does at a lot of its chapters, is it trains people and it provides different sorts of training to different people who have different experiences. And that's how we get people on the same level. I don't think people are even entering the conversation at the same level. If people aren't entering the conversation at the same level, how can you expect people to have a conversation? Um, so that's what I would like to add to that. Well, we are uh, at our time for opening up to audience questions and answers. I really welcome your questions. And if I would like you to uh, say your name and organization and, and uh, ask, a, ask a question. So, um, we'll start with this fellow here. Thank you. Uh, oh, wait for the microphone, please. Uh, thank you. I'm Leon, I'm Leon Weintraub. Uh, I was a member of the Foreign Service. I'm now retired. Uh, <laughs> listening to the moderator talk about the snowflake generation and the coddling, uh, about a year or two ago, a book was published called The Coddling of the American Mind. And some of you are nodding. I guess you read it. And perhaps it's heavily anecdotal. Uh, but it does uh, uh, discuss a number of, of campuses ar around the country where there was almost a herd mentality against either student expression or faculty expression. Uh, in the discussion of the book, uh, when, when uh, at a think tank here in Washington, the, 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 the authors kind of raised an interesting type of a metric. They, 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 they asked among the audience, how old were you when you had a certain experience on your own, like the first time you were able to walk to school on your own. And the metric they discovered was that the older you were in the audience now, the younger you were when you were allowed to do this. <laughs> so the younger people in the audience were f forced to defer t to authority for much longer. And he thought there was kind of a relationship there that the students coming in now were much more likely to look up to some kind of authority and not think on their own. And I'm wondering if, if any of you had experiences on campus of this kind of a herd, men, herd mentality where the students were really kind of afraid of, of hear, hearing different opinions and it generated a pretty ugly experience or, or whether those were simply anecdotal and did not really add up to data. Um, so at American University, it's funny you mentioned the calling American Mind because Greg Lukianoff is actually a, an AU alum. Uh, so at AU last fall, I want to say we hosted, uh, well, we didn't host, there was a group on campus that hosted uh, a speaker on campus, very controversial, Dinesh D'Souza. And there was a significant um, portion of the, of the student population that was very much against that. And then within that portion of the population, there was a group of students who were heavily advocating for the administrators to step in, to disinvite the speaker, uh, to ban the club, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, the administration, it, it, saying it didn't cave in is, is too weak a word, because the administration didn't even bother to you know, go on and, and, and entertain this idea that somebody should be taken off the campus. Uh, but at the same time, the fact that there was a group of students that had that belief, and most of the arguments that they had were paternalistic in the nature that they were, you know, that university's job is to defend us, to protect us, to be our parent while we're here. So I would say that there's definitely, at least from my experience as an American, there is a, a basis for that. And, and there's a group of students that will often use those sorts of arguments. They'll look to the university for that. And is that a pretty small group, or is it a significant group? I would say, it, depending on the nature of the event, the group uh, grow, like it grows or it lessens. Yeah. If it's the more controversial, the sort of bigger it becomes. If we were to invite, I, I don't know, a KKK Grand Wizard on campus, I'm assuming the the group would be much, much larger than it was with Dinesh D'Souza. If we have, uh, for example, there was another speaker from the Daily Caller who had a very controversial talk for her topic. The name of the talk was No, Don't Believe All Women, and this was around the time of the Kavanaugh nomination. Uh, so it was very controversial, very sort of hot button issue. 
And for that, actually, the group of students was severely smaller because it was a smaller event. The speaker wasn't uh, very well known outside of like their sphere and whatnot. So that size definitely grows or shrinks depending on how controversial and how offensive the speaker is seen as being. And it's one of the things that faculty can do is to be, uh, as, as advisors or college leaders, you know, uh, there's certain people that are just not bringing an intellectually serious viewpoint to the conversation. And one of the roles that faculty can play is to counsel against inviting these provocateurs who mean just to get attention for themselves, really, rather than to advance the conversation. But others, others on this coddling thesis. Well, it's actually interesting. Um, Jonathan Haidt, one of the authors of The Coddling American Mind, um, he actually came, President Crutcher invited him as one of the Sharp Speaker Series. And so he came to speak to Canvas about viewpoint diversity. Um, and so it was great having him kind of go through um, kind of the same arguments that he went um, with the book. Um, one of the things is, so I definitely think there is kind of a herd mentality, but it's a lot smaller. And so like an example is we had Carl Rove come to speak on campus. and we also had, um, as I mentioned, Ryan Anderson. Um, and for both those speakers, there was a push by both faculty and um, some students to disinvite them, um, which is very interesting because Karl Rove is like a generally like mod like moderate Republican. Um, so that there is a put like a concerted push um, to disinvite Karl Rove, ban him from speaking on campus, um, is very interesting. It's a small group, like it's a very small herd, but I, I do still think it comes in like that kind of herd mentality um, that there is still this push um, to disinvite, give no platform. And so it's good that like there's administrators and the vast amount of people that absolutely support um, the right for that speaker not to be disinvited. Um, but I think it's just interesting where you have a very like small, um, super vocal herd um, that are anti, and you have like a bunch of moderate people that aren't speaking out super strongly. Um, it looks very different than like the actual like numbers um, play out. So I, I think that's kind of how like the herd mentality can play out on campuses. You can have a very small mi like minority of voices that can. Bring bring like, a lot of um, weight to bear on an issue that a lot of people actually disagree with that minority on. I know we have a lot of hands, so I want to get to others. Um, Mr. Worcester. Hi. Um, I'm Martin Worcester. I'm old enough that they did have phones when I was in college, but they had just been invented, and you wouldn't believe how big they were. <laughs> um, two things. I have never heard of a better angels debate. Can you tell me in two paragraphs what it is and how it protects from idiots trying, I'm sorry, uh, foes of free speech, idiot is a pejorative term, uh, from trying to shut down the event? And second, have you all had any encounters with administrators who were sort of hostile to free speech? Uh, I'm thinking of Oberlin. Hmm. Um, so for the Better Angels debate, uh, a sort of quick synopsis of how they're supposed to run. So Better Angels is a nonprofit organization that hosts these debates. Originally, they started hosting them, I believe, at the community level. Hmm. Then they moved on to hosting them at the high school level. And then the very first college level debate they hosted was, I want to say, at Tennessee State University. And then they hosted the next one at American University. And this whole idea is you get a group of people together who want to host this debate, and you go around and you pull people. You, you, you first try to come up with a topic, and you try to find a topic that on a scale of 1 to 5 on the controversy scale is maybe at a 3 or a 4. It has to be in controversial enough that people want to talk about it, but not so much so that people will automatically shut down at the mere mention of it. And then you distill that topic to the most basic form, you know, a normative statement. Uh, for example, the, top, the topic we had at American University was resolved healthcare is a human right. And there's a clear you approve or you disapprove. And you have this normative topic. And then you go around and you try to get a 50-50 split on campus. It can't be something where 99% of the campus leans one way and only 1% leans the other way, because it's not much of a debate. And if you get all of those qualifications, you have your sort of debate set up. So then what you have afterwards is a moderator whose job it is to, A, like control the room, make sure people are behaving, sort of set the guidelines, set the standards for how the debate should be. And by keeping it A, a normative debate, you get away from the sort of controversial issue of whose facts are right. Um, and then B, by having you know, this moderator who's trained and who knows how to sort of keep people calm and whatnot, uh, you prevent people from being overtly 
uh, provocative in their speeches. And we had a lot of people, and everybody in the audience can come up and speak, and then anybody can go up and ask questions. And the whole idea of the debate, it isn't to change somebody's mind, it's essentially to force people to listen to the opposite viewpoint. And we had students who shared very, very personal stories and their experience with healthcare, having um, see, you know, serious illnesses. And, and they were very open to a room of strangers. And my favorite part about the debate is we were expecting you know, like 20 people to show up. And so we ordered food for about 25 people. We had more than 75 students show up most of which were freshmen. And the reason they showed up is there was a freshman initiative at AU called the AU Experience. There's a sort of checklist you have to go through to get through this stuff for credit. And one of the things in that checklist was uh, go to an event that is outside of your comfort zone. And I'm very happy to say that every single freshman in that room chose my event as the event that was outside of their comfort zone, uh, or our event. It wasn't just mine. So that is a, just the general breakdown of how the debates are supposed to run. Yeah, um, yeah. I, uh, so others on on, uh, on uh, I guess we don't have anybody from Overland, but administrators are on debates. Uh, just super quickly, um, I think that. I just want to challenge us a little bit in the sense that a lot of these debates that we host, and this is one of the things that Bridge USA is trying to now get at, is there's a self-selection that you know a lot of these Better Angels debates, a lot of our, and there's not just you know Better Angels, but Bridge and a lot of the national organizations working on this issue, you just generally get moderates, right? And as I said, you mainly get the pragmatic people, the people that are actually interested in some sort of compromise. And this is this is the the paradox is this is that we've almost created our own echo chamber of people that support this issue. So one of the things that Bridge has started to do is we, we tr are now going to start requiring a lot of chapters and a lot of leaders to find an issue and then actually engage the most active students on that issue and invite them to conversation. So for example, at Berkeley, uh, the Berkeley chapter had, and I take all the credit for Berkeley, by the way, I have no involvement in the actual Berkeley chapter. These are, these are like the guy who leads it is a pre-med student. So the, uh, the Berkeley chapter, they hosted a debate on immigration and they had DACA students come so real, real people that are actually impacted by this, not you know policy wonks. And Trump voters and a lot of students who were from the Texas region, and specifically uh, El Paso, so people whose families have actually been victims of crimes. And they had those people engage. And there was this one instance in the debate where this, uh, this uh, female student was talking about sort of her experience, and this, this student stood up. And he was this like domineering male guy, and he put on his MAGA hat, and we're like, "Well, here it goes." And uh, get ready, get your phones out. Here's social media. And what we found was it actually she engaged him in the most constructive possible way that you could think, where she genuinely explained her position. He ended up explaining why his family was victimized by some criminals that had crossed the border, and they were like, "Wow, you know what we should do? We should realize that we both have common pain." And maybe we should find common purpose to solve that pain, rather than figuring out ways to divide ourselves and prevent anyone's pain from being resolved. So we have to really start challenging ourselves to make sure that people that wouldn't think of these ideas actually enter these debates and forums. Yeah. Another question, uh, just one in the back, with, that, with the cap on. Thank you very much. My name is Yaya Fnusi with the United States of Africa 2017 Project Task Force. I came to this country in September 1967. I was involved with the Black Panthers on the ground and civil rights and all the anti-war. If I had come to this country today, this time, this period, I would have committed a lot of crimes, political crimes. Because when I came, the political culture of this country was the ideological division but each faction will always have conversation and discussion, not this inferiority complex that you're getting now from the people of the left. I hope you keep on doing what you're doing. Thank you. Um, Ms. Zitta. Um, yes, my name is Kathy Zitta, and I was wondering oh. whether you all are The microphone is coming to you. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Kathy Sitta, and I was wondering whether you all would support a white supremacist or neo-Nazi group coming to your campus to speak. So um, at SFE, we have the sort of privilege of being at a private institution. So we would defend their right to come to campus. Uh, but also we would, you know, we, we would encourage students to speak out against it. 
just because you defend somebody's right to show up and speak, even if it's somebody who might be hurtful, and I shared, you know, I'm myself, I'm a Hispanic immigrant, uh, it doesn't mean that you have to shut them down. And the university could even go as far as to say that they denounce their speaker without going so far as to ban them from campus or disinvite them from campus. Uh, so I, I would definitely, if there was talk about this invitation, I would, it would be difficult and it would definitely tarnish my reputation amongst my fellow students. But I'd like to believe that I would stand up and I would fight for their right to come speak. And I would help, I would like to believe that would also help prepare the student body for what's going to happen and how to engage or choose to not engage in a respectful fashion so that things don't get out of control. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, in, in one of the original inceptions of Bridge USA, we had this little insurrection amongst our group, and this student invited uh, Ann Coulter without talking to anyone on the board. And Ann Coulter came to UC Berkeley, or she didn't come to UC Berkeley, but there's a huge, huge uh, controversy around this. And uh, we had multiple op-eds and all that stuff going around. And afterwards, our organizations thought hard, you know, what's, what's, what's sort of the criteria for what a speaker should entail and who, who should be invited to campus. Now, in the case of Ann Coulter, what we thought about and what we realized was before our criteria was anyone that has social currency in this country. And then we're like, wait, crap. So does like Richard Spencer. So um, then we, we thought social currency and social capital can't be the criteria. We decided that there's three three components, at least in terms of our organization. And I think I think like SFU would also agree with this, is uh, you've got to be you have to have a history of responsible discourse where your objective has not been to rabble rouse and invoke people. Second, you have to engage uh, constructively with a second panelist. We never invite one speaker. We always have to, we have a commitment that you invite both. And what we actually did to Ann Coulter was uh, a year later she asked to come again. We said, we sent her a letter and, and it was sort of like a, from our end, it was actually a trap. We wanted to see whether or not she was actually interested in constructive engagement. We sent her a letter and we said, you can only come if you debate someone else. And she was like, no. Or she didn't actually respond, so I took that as a no. Um, <laughs> and so that explains her perspective. And then uh, the third the third perspective is that they have to be solution oriented. What that means is that at the end of their discussion, they have to propose a policy, not just advocate a belief, because anyone can advocate a belief and that does very little. Um, and in terms of a white supremacist group, don't even talk about it. Don't support their right to come. Don't defend their right to come. Just blow out the fire. I mean, what this is, you know, when, when, we, when students invite certain groups just to incite, this is what the trap that both liberals and conservatives fall into is in an attempt to actually shut down the group, you only give them a platform. So I would, I would not defend their right, nor would I advocate for them. Just stay silent. Other questions? Uh, yes, fell in the back. Uh, my name is Roger Cochetti, and I was a student body president um, from 1971 to 1972. So for those of you who are student body presidents, you can look at me, and this is what you have to look forward to in 50 years. <laughs> um, I, I want to echo one of the comments made a moment ago, but observe, make two quick observations and then a question. Um, w comparing those days, which were tumultuous, with, the, with today, the first thing you'd have to say is that anybody who lived through the Symbionese Liberation Army, George Wallace, the American Nazi Party, the Weathermen, the SDS, um, you know, would have to find the characterization of Ann Coulter as an extremist uh, laughable. Uh, you know, the, the, the range of debate of speech in those days was so much broader than the range of legitimate speech today. And in fact, hate speech or hateful speech was common. It was just, you know, that was, that's what George Wallace did. That's what certain people in the Symbionese Liberation Army did. That was their, their message and they had every right to convey it. Secondly, authority, where, where as, a, as, a, as a 18 through 22 year old, where do you get your authority figures from? Obviously this was well before the internet. It was even before cable television. So what you did not have were sort of this whole range of people shouting as authority figures. You relied heavily on your professors, on the faculty, as a points of sort of, and in those days, I never once ever heard any faculty member from anywhere, and I did, I was involved in national level student politics as well. 
um, suggests that speech should be shut down. It should be opposed. You should demonstrate. You should, you know, march. But shutting down, I never, ever heard a faculty mm. member suggest the uh, yeah. shutdown of speech so that I was shocked. For example, in one of the previous yeah. programs where someone said we would invite anybody except a circus clown. And we had no such category as circus clown. So my question is, is there a, pre is there a presence on campus today of, of faculty who actually encourage a shutdown of speech, even at the extreme, obviously it would be at the extreme ends. Moderate speech is never shut down, it's extreme. So is there a presence among faculty who encourage a shutdown of um, extreme speech on campus? Thank you. I don't believe that uh, on my campus I've heard of this uh, instance in specific and I actually feel like I've experienced the opposite. Um, I'm actually currently in a course called University Blacklist where we were reading um, 10 authors who were disinvited from campus over the last few years um, and have had the opportunity or will have the opportunity this semester myself in that class um, to listen to what they have to say and hopefully uh, as a class come together to perhaps understand the validity of their arguments but also understand where their um, viewpoints might uh, fall short. Um, and I think that engagement with beliefs um, and actually learning to understand it um, and actually having the experience to go through the process of coming up with an argument that would disagree with them is equally important. I feel like we'll have time for one last question from the front row here. Um, we have a microphone up to the front? Yes. Um. First of all, I think we all want to thank you for your uh, admirable efforts on campus and uh, for your very helpful comments here today. Um, uh, but your comments, uh, the range of things that were uh, raised was so broad that it's hard to, that it raises many questions, hard to know how to, can, to uh, limit oneself. But to ask a sort of question and a half, um, all the news that we hear seems very different from your r very rational statements. Um, when he continues to hear about all sorts of uh, university president firings at the level on the basis of some protest or another by not necessarily the most moderate groups. Um, and what we also see is very little institutional resistance to uh, efforts like that. I mean, what you have is um, faculty which supports, let's say, the 96% of speeches going in one direction, or which which uh, limits the core, you know, eliminates Western things from the core teachings, <laughs> as at AU or whatever, um, and uh, you know, uh, also uh, administrations which are so willing to cave in, or which promote, you know, uh, the the limitations that we're t you've been talking about, and part of this was due to the Obama administration interpretation of Title IX, mm -hmm. in which the university administrations could be sued you know, so easily for uh, you know, anything which, which, not even necessarily a reasonable um, ground for protest, but any ground uh, uh, deemed harmful, um, whether reasonable or not. And so the question is, re to what extent does the, does the whole atmosphere, especially from the institution, um, encourage students to, you know, the, the, the activism of those most likely to want to limit free speech, um, which it seems to me that it does. But. So, yeah. Well, by the way, I, I, and this is not to say that there isn't a problem, but what you don't hear about are the 90% of efforts to protect free speech. And one of the things that I want to emphasize, not only on the issue of free speech, but this is one of the things that really is frustrating is issues are dominated by the, the by the cases in the minority and then we pick on those cases and then we paint everything as a generalization now this is not again to say that the problem doesn't exist nor is it a serious problem i think we've outlined that it's a serious problem but you know i bet you didn't hear that we helped change berkeley's free speech policy i bet that no one covered the fact that arizona state raised six million dollars to start a school for civil and economic thought i bet that you didn't hear that uh, there's a campus coalition going around where a bunch of schools are starting civic innovation institutes. So what we need to do here is we need to make sure that we don't conflate a problem with rhetoric that we see on both sides. And this is both with the left and the right. 
that being said, it's obviously an issue. Um, the firings that happen, again, I, I think that you can't generalize across the firings, but I agree with you that there's issues with both the way that the Obama administration, you know, administered a lot of those uh, interpretations of Title IX, but then I think also, you know, you go back to sort of President Bush and what Trump, President Trump is doing on a lot of these issues. So again, let's not polarize the topic and let's make sure that we don't let rhetoric conflate the seriousness of the issue. Yep. I think it just comes back to it's important to have both like a partnership between like the top down like the institutional approach but then also like the grassroots like student approach and so like at least at Richmond um, I've been very lucky to have like administrative support so like when Carl Rove like there was protest to disinvite Carl Rove or there were protest to disinvite Ryan Anderson President Crutcher like clearly said we will not disinvite these speakers these are our policies and issued like public statements and so there are like administrators there are institutions that are like providing support it's less heard of um, than like someone that would call um, for a disinvitation. But then also that's not enough, too, because you also then need students to actually show up and challenge those speakers when they actually come to campus. It can't be that we're just not going to disinvite them and that there will be just no response. What should be is we should actually have like a conversation that they shouldn't be disinvited, but if they have views that you disagree with, they should be challenged in an appropriate, respectful manner, that we actually like advance dialogue on our campus. And so that's why you need a partnership between both sides. If you just do a top-down approach, you're not going to be that successful. And if you do just a grassroots approach and you're overruled by institutions and administrators, it's going to be very hard to actually like affect change. And so I think that's why the partnership is key. On that note, we have to conclude today. I do want to thank all of our panels very much. It's really, um, I couldn't imagine a more inspiring Constitution Day. So thanks very much. My sincere thanks to all of you. Uh, we uh, have a Campus Free Expression newsletter, and I'd uh, like you to uh, let me know if you'd like to join our newsletter. We will be having uh, the live tape of this, or the tape of this event. It'll be uh, up online tomorrow for you to share with your friends and colleagues who weren't able to join us today. So thank you all very much for joining us today.